<laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome Good all. Everyone. Greetings to all. Um, do you want to start, Leo? Um, yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. Just a second. Yeah, this is, uh, we would like to welcome to room two. This is the room where uh, PhD students are going to do presentations uh, in the Emerging Young Scientists uh, session of the third workshop on inflammation. And I think the uh, 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 first thing that we would like to do is to congratulate the five speakers that are here because they are already are recipients of honorable mentions of the workshop. Um, what else, Leo? <laughs> and... Um, um, so in this in this room, all uh, speakers are PhD students, and they are going to uh, present their work. And they are aware that they have about ten minutes uh, to do the presentations. And we welcome everybody to to share comments and questions um, in the chat, um, so we can. Uh, discuss with the students uh, at the end of each presentation. Sorry, um, guys, I, I had a problem here. I was hearing. I in, got it. In, <laughs> That's in, okay. In double, I, I was I was completely messed here. So I'm Leonardo, as Chris told you. Um, yeah, I didn't present myself. <laughs> yeah. So Leonardo and Chris, we we are both professors at the Institute of Applied Physics, Carlos Chagas Filho. Um, I'm very happy to be happy and honored to be here. Um, I think this meeting is made for you, uh, students. Um, I'm pretty sure we have uh, great work presented here. Um, so who's the first? Let's start with Beatriz, right? Yes, Beatriz Tomaso, please. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my... Are you seeing that? Yes. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my work here with you. My name is Beatriz Bastos de Moraes Tomasi, and my work is entitled Enteric Glial Cell Response in Colonic Layers and Modulation of Mucosa TNF-alpha and Occluding During Neurodegeneration in the Mice Model of Parkinson's Disease induced by 6-hydroxydopamine. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you, or for some of you, the enteric nervous system, also known as the second brain. Uh, enteric nervous system is a large and rich neuroglial network that extends throughout the gastrointestinal tract and is divided in two major plexus. The myenteric plexus in black and submucosal plexus in pink. Enteric nervous system is composed by um, enteric neurons and enteric glial cells that uh, command several gut functions as motility, blood flow, and uh, monomodulation. Uh, enteric, enteric glial cells outnumber enteric neurons and have relevant functions for gut homeostasis. These cells can secrete and release several immunomodulatory molecules including pro and inflammatory cytokines, and also some factors that regulate the function of intestinal epithelial barrier. Similarly to the astrocytes in the central nervous system, enteric glial cells can undergo a reactivity a feature, a reactivity process, gain some new functions, and producing immunomodulation, what is relevant to good pathologies, among them Parkinson's disease. So nowadays, Parkinson's disease is considered um, a multicentric disorder, not only a central neurodegenerative pathology. And one of the first sites affected during the pathology is the enteric nervous system. Here in the, this figure, we can see the Lewy bodies in the gastrointestinal tracts of patients uh, pointed by these black uh, arrows. 
Also, patients with Parkinson's disease present a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms, mainly constipation. Another feature of gastrointestinal tract of patients of Parkinson's disease is the colonic inflammation and also glial, glial activity. All this data was, uh, has been obtained through biopsies, through colonoscopies. Uh, instead of the gain uh, through this approach, uh, the colonoscopy doesn't allow a global assessment of the all plexus of the entire kind of system, of the layers. So the use of animal model has been uh, a relevant tool to study physiopathological aspects of the Parkinson's disease. In our lab, we use the animal model of Parkinson's disease inducted by 6-hydroxydopamine, that is a specific dopamine, dopaminergic uh, neurotoxin. There, we promoted a uh, 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 unilateral striatal injection of this neurotoxin in the striatal body, promoting the neurodegeneration of the nigro striatal pathway as happened in the disease. Uh, if, uh, in addition to the neurodegeneration of this pathway, this model is capable of to produce also gastrointestinal dysfunction. So we work with C57 black six mice, two, three months old. And through stereotactical procedures, we produce two main, uh, two main experimental groups. The animal model of Parkinson's disease that receives the neurotoxin, the 6-hydroxydopamine in the striatum, and the control group that passed through the surgical process but didn't receive any neurotoxin. And then we uh, analyzed the enteric nervous system, more specifically the, the large intestine response, 48 hours, one week, and two weeks post mother induction or post control injection. So our main goal here was to perform a temporal analysis of glio and immune markers in order to characterize these components along with the neurodegenerative course in this animal model. More specifically, we we aim it to analyze the percentage of water in the animal feces to identify histomorphological features induced by neurodegeneration in these times, to investigate through Western blotting using micro dissected samples, of, uh, uh, analyzing specific samples of neuromuscular compartment and the mucosal layer in different size, times, different proteins, for example. Uh, we analyzed the glioprotein GFAP in the neuromuscular compartment, the pro-inflammatory cytokine PNF-alpha in the mucosal layer, the glial cell derivative neurotoxic factor GDNF in the mucosal layer, and the occluding protein important side junctions of the intestinal epithelial barrier also in the mucosal layer. So uh, uh, when we analyzed the percentage of water in the feces, comparing control group with the animal model of Parkinson's disease, we found that uh, from one week post model induction, animal model of Parkinson's disease uh, presents a decreased percentage of water in their feces. And uh, notice that when we look to a shorter period of time after model induction as 48 hours, we didn't find a difference between groups. This data indicated to us that uh, from one week post lesion, post neurodegeneration induction, there is uh, some dysfunctional part, uh, uh, pattern in the gastrointestinal tract. We also identified uh, some histomorphological modifications in colonic mucosa. So when comparing the animal model of Parkinson's disease, one week post lesion, two weeks post lesion with control group, we identified some inflammatory infiltrates in the mucosa layer alteration in the crypt, in the distribution of the crypt, and also a discontinuity of the intestinal epithelial barrier. Here pointed by these black arrow reds, we are pointing the myenteric ganglia and note, note that compared to the control group, there is an enlargement of the neural structure. And when we perform uh, morphometric measurements, we identify there is a significant uh, increase in the ganglia area in the animal model of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in view of these findings, uh, we decided to look for some previous alterations, some early alterations, uh, 48 hours post model induction, and we started this investigation looking for alterations in entire glial cells. So we performed an Western blotting, and 
against GFSE, this protein, a specific glial cell protein, and we found that just 48 hours post-model induction, uh, animal model of Parkinson's disease uh, presents an increased content of this, pro this protein in the neuromuscular layer, uh, pointing to a reactiv reactivity profile of these cells. We also studied the signaling pathway P38 MAPK, uh, a signaling pathway commonly involved with in inflammatory responses and also with reactivity of glial cells in general. And we found that just 48 hours after mother induction, there is uh, activation of this signaling pathway, pathway specifically in the neuromuscular compartment, in the neuromuscular layer. Uh, that we identified by the phosphorylated form of this protein. Uh, we also uh, studied some proteins, some inflammatory in glial biomarkers in the mucosal samples, in the mucosal layer samples, but in this time we didn't find the difference between control in animal model of Parkinson's disease uh, regarding to TNF alpha expression, GDNF, and also about occlusion. However, uh, when we looked for the period of one week post lesion, uh, in addition to uh, increased GFAP content in the neuromuscular layer, when compared with control group, the animal model of Parkinson's disease also presented alterations, increased the levels, increased the content of TNF alpha and GDNF and occluding. It's relevant to, it's important to highlight that these uh, common biomarkers is a, a, a specific signaling pathway, GDNF and occludin, uh, they are involved with colonic inflammation. This upper regulation is commonly found in during colonic inflammation uh, as a response to, as a protective response to the epithelium. Also, during this period of time, one week post lesion, we found some alterations in morphology of enteric glial cells, more specifically my enteric glia. So here, uh, comparing control to six hydroxydopamine animals, uh, the, enteric, the enteric glial cells, the my enteric glia, lost his common shape, gaining a amoeboid profile, points to a reactivity uh, feature, a reactivity pro profile. Also, investigating another specific glial cell, uh, a glial pr protein, S200 beta, we detected uh, less immunolabeling for this protein. So, this data indicated to us that there is a, a reactivity profile in the gastrointestinal tract in the large intestine of animals submitted to this model with a heterogeneous regulation of glial biomarkers. And finally, two weeks post lesion, we detect that. Uh, no difference in the content of GFAP in the neuromuscular layer, no difference in the mucosa layer regarding to TNF alpha, GDNF. In the meantime, occluding was detected decreased in these samples, in mucosal samples. So we conclude that enteric glial activity occurs just 48 hours post mode induction, showing a fast involvement of enteric glial network during neurodegeneration. Also, enteric inflammation is accompanied by GDNF and occlusion increase, a common response of glial network uh, when regulating the intestinal barrier during inflammatory conditions. Decreased occluding possibly reflects the structural plasticity of the intestinal epithelial barrier in a more advanced neurodegenerative time point in our model. So, in general, we conclude that enteric glial cell modulation may be an early enteric sign, sign induced by Parkinsonian neurodegeneration that is followed by inflammatory dysmotility signs and intestinal epithelial barrier structural plasticity pointing to these cells as a possible mediator of the good brain axis. So thank you again for, for the opportunity to share my work here with, with you. I would like to say thank you to Neuroscience Program at Universidade Federal Fluminense and say thank you to Laboratório da Interação Neuroglia. Congratulations, Beatriz. Very good talk. Very um, very nice work, very well presented. But uh, it was a little bit longer than 
And so we have time for a very quick question. Um, okay. Um, Can I, I have a very quick question and general question, right? It's not my area of expertise at all. But I was wondering if there is any connection between microbiota um, alterations during uh, uh, Parkinson diseases. Yes. Yes, okay. there is. Uh, there is no. There is no um, a signature of microbiota during Parkinson's disease. There is a lot of work describing alterations of, along the globe because of diet, way of life, it is very difficult to achieve a specific signature of microbiota, microbiome, microbiota in Parkinson's disease. But some, uh, some alterations is very recognized as firmicutes and bacteriates being altered. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just, just, just tell me, how well established is, is, is your Parkinson's uh, disease model? I mean, what's your considerations about your model? It's a, uh, a, I think it, it's a good exercise to, 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 mm -hmm. to, yeah, to know very... the advantages and the problems that every, yeah. each model has. Yes, it's a very traditional classic model, but as any model, there is some limitations. For example, in this model, we don't have a delivery body common of the Parkinson's disease. And on the other hand, there is a lot of biomarks of the disease as gastrointestinal dysfunction, uh, olfactory alteration, uh, behavioral uh, uh, modifications concerned to related to Parkinson's disease. So. Uh, uh, in the literature, there is a lot of, of work describing alterations in the gastrointestinal tract using this model. So, in view of this, it's very relevant to, uh, in my job, in my, in my work, uh, studying more, more short periods of time, I think it's a relevant approach because we look for previous and early alterations. There is a approach that has been discussed for Parkinson's disease as a disease that starts very before the first motor symptom. So I think there is limit, there are limitations, but is a useful tool to study the pathology. Perfect. Thank you very much, Beatriz. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you Let's move on. Let's call the next speaker. Um, that is Philippe. I, I, I think so. Uh, I, I, my list just closed here. Sorry. Yes, Felipe. That's Felipe me. Lesser. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I, I, I think Beatriz is still here. Beatriz, you should check the, the YouTube uh, comments because I think there is another question there if you want to answer there. And let's, so let's continue. Felipe, it's with you. Thank you, Professor Cristiani. Thank you, Leonardo. So uh, we're moving to the to the presentation. So let's just okay. That's that's fine. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you, the event organizers for this huge opportunity. My name is Philippe Les. I'm a medical doctor and currently a doctoral student. Uh, in neuroscience at the morphological science program at the laboratory of Professor Flavio Lima at the Institute of Biomedical Science of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where I've been dedicated to study the pathway of CCL21 chemocoin uh, and its receptor CCR7 in the interaction between microglia and neuron in a whole novel model of sporadic Parkinson's disease. Well, according to a um, recent review on this pathology published on, uh, in 2018 on the 100th uh, anniversary of its first description by its this gentleman here, uh, James Parkinson, Parkinson's disease is a degenerative disease of the central nervous system caused by an intense decrease of the production of dopamine and causes with uh, typical symptoms as bradykinesia, rigidity, posture instability, and breast tremors. So it was um, it has a prevalence of 0.2% in 
in the general population and can reach to uh, 1% among those over uh, 65 years old. Um, it causes 1.5 million new cases a year, making it the most common movement disorder uh, in the whole world and the second most prevalent neurodegenerative disease uh, right after the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and it's particularly worrisome in a population that ages day after day as ours do. So the idea that neuroinflammation represents a key milestone in the progression of Parkinson's disease, it's not new at all. Um, in that context, we decided to use our expertise uh, of our laboratory of more than 20 years uh, studying microglial cells to, the, to, to delve deeper uh, into the role of chemokines, which are modulating proteins of the immune system during the progression of Parkinson's disease. Uh, of these multiple chemokines, uh, CCL21 uh, has already been described as key factor in the pathogenesis of several malignant neoplasms, uh, such as pancreas, uh, breast and lung cancer, autoimmune disease, such as systemic sclerosis and uh, uh, arthritis, and more recently in neuroinflammatory disease and the, in the generic disease, uh, such as uh, MS, sorry, multiple sclerosis. Uh, and even uh, it's been studied as a um, biomarker and even therapeutic target for some of these conditions. So uh, our goals, uh, therefore, is to analyze the action of CCL21 CCR7 pathway in the interaction between neurons and microglia and how this conversation um, contributes to neuroinflammation and neurodegenerative, and sorry, neurodegeneration during the progression of Parkinson's disease. Therefore, uh, we thought to validate a new treatment model uh, with 3,4-D hydroxyphenyl acetaldehyde, also known as DOPAL, for the study of sporadic Parkinson's disease. Basing on this model, uh, we sought to identify and quantify the CCL21 secreted by the generating neurons, uh, the effect on this neuronal CCL21 on microglia, and the factors uh, secreted by microglia in response to that stimuli. So uh, DOPAL is a natural metabolite uh, of dopamine, uh, which directly interacts with lysine and methionine reduce, uh, residues of alpha-synuclein protein uh, and induce, induce uh, their aggregation into neurotoxic oligomers. So we, be we begin here by demonstrating the treatment uh, with dopau at the dose of 50 uh, micromolar, reduce the viability of neuron length the viability and neuron, uh, neuritic length of culture midbrain ne uh, dopaminergic neurons, uh, but does not uh, directly affect primary mic microglia cells. So we have seen uh, through immunostaining and Western blotting that treatment with dopau induced the expression of CCL21 by neurons here. So both uh, primary microglia of mice and human patients uh, in the uh, neurosurgery service at the University Hospital of UFRJ express the CCR7 receptor. And when treated with these cells uh, with a conditioned medium of degenerating neurons, we can observe an increase uh, in, pro in proliferation and migration of microglia. Uh, when this conditioned medium is pre-incubated for uh, 50 minutes, approximately with anti-CCL21 uh, or anti-CCR7 neutralizing antibodies, this proliferation and migration induced effect is lost. So nevertheless, uh, we observe that the neutralization of CCL21 in this condition, this same condition medium, can induce the, the reduction of anti-inflammatory uh, microglial markers, such as uh, Manos receptor type 1 and MMP9. Uh, uh, in contrast, uh, we saw the increase of pro-inflammatory markers such as MHC-10 
type 2, uh, EL1 beta, and uh, TNF alpha. Uh, otherwise, when neurons uh, are then treated with condition medium from microlia uh, previously activated with condition medium from degenerating neurons, uh, there appears to be an increase uh, in the length of neuritic processes. So next, uh, we implemented stereotaxic injections to administer uh, DOPA and alpha-synuclein oligomers into the striatum of adult Swiss mice, uh, showed right here. Um, and uh, when we observed that these mice developed after 7 and 30 days uh, after the injection, a worsening of their motor performance, such as worse turn and descend latency time in the poll test, uh, even a shorter time uh, latency to fall in both uh, wire hang and hot hodge test, and also a loss to nofotory discrimination capacity between environmental uh, with familiar and non-familiar odors, which are all characteristic of Parkinson's disease models. Analyzing the brains uh, of these animals, we noticed that uh, the treatment, the treated animals have uh, in the striatum a more or lesser number uh, of neuronal cells positive to beta 3 tubulina, beta 3 tubulin, sorry, and these uh, express more intensely CCL21. CCL right here. Um, okay, furthermore, the, treat the treated animals had a more considerable number of IBO1 positive micro uh, microglial cells, especially in the side it's lateral of the lesion. And this strongly expresses your seven receptor in the surface, which would increase uh, in colocalization between these two markers. Um, the microglia on the side of the lesion also has a morphological profile with more uh, limited uh, length of branches and uh, a higher circularity, uh, which suggests a more amoeboid form and uh, uh, and a uh, smaller cell diameter. So at, la uh, at least um, we started to investigate potential inhibitors, molecules, to use them as treatment for our Parkinson's disease model mice. For that, we use molecular docking in silico modeling uh, to identify these target sites. Uh, to date, uh, we have identified three top candidates which, uh, with high affinity to CCR7, which are Cozalin, MP2109, and Navarexin. We're now in, in, in the acquisition phase of these molecules, molecules and uh, to test them in vivo in our Parkinson's disease model. Well, uh, concluding, uh, in conclusion, Dopal when compared to alpha synuclein, which is a model uh, already well validated in, in scientific literature, uh, seems to cons uh, consistently reproduce phenotypic aspects of the uh, of Parkinson's disease and may represent an adequate model uh, for the study of this disease. Furthermore, although the, the, the results are still preliminary, uh, they suggest that CCL21 CCR7 pathway is involved somehow in neuron microglia interact intracellular communication uh, during the progression of, of neuroinflammatory phenotype in the uh, Parkinson's disease model. And it may be a promising factor in the study of new target specific markers uh, and therapy for uh, Parkinson's disease. A special thanks to our uh, funding agencies and uh, our, our lab collaborators. Congratulations. Congrats. Great Very speaker. Nice, <laughs> nice data. <laughs> um, let's check YouTube. Yeah, there is a, a question from Vanderlei da Silva Fraga. Um, and he says, congratulations for the amazing work, Felipe. In your mice model, did you see significant degeneration of the substantia nigra in the midbrain? That's a, a great question. Uh, well, yes, we are having some problems right now to, to, to stain the, 
this new, uh, dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, but we are still working on this on the on these results. But um, yes, we do. So it, it anticipates that there, there may be some uh, upstream degeneration because we, we injected uh, the dopau, both dopau and alpha-synuclein directly on the striatum, which is uh, most mostly where the, the, these uh, substantia nigra neurons, dopaminergic neurons communicate. Uh, so if we see the, the generation of substantia nigra, it suggests that somehow uh, closer, I mean, uh, approximately, we have an effect, an effect of this dopal or of snuclein in the in the cell bodies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, beautiful data, pre preliminary data. You call yeah. on CCR seven and CCR twenty one. Uh, how do how, how do you plan to further investigate the involvement? What you design your. <laughs> yeah. You said that you want to investigate further and they involve Yeah, you. sure. Yeah, that's our uh, that's our uh, purpose here. Yeah, uh, we're trying to acquire a few inhibitors, as I said, for a, a specific CCR savvy inhibitors to inject both in our yes. uh, in our rat or to treat our uh, mice models. And uh, also we are looking for some uh, knockout models, genetic models for CCR7, which are uh, already in commercial laboratories. Uh, for both CCR7 and CCL21. Uh, Perfect. That's but uh, it, there is a, a, a small problem with the, those, both of those um, models because CCR7 has multiple uh, signaling, signaling uh, pathway. So uh, we want to investigate specif specifically CCL21. We cannot uh, knock out the, the whole CCR7 receptor. And if we want to investigate CCL21, we also cannot uh, eliminate all the chemokines produced by lymphocytes. So uh, CCL21, CCL19, uh, they are born no count in the, on those masses. So we have all of those model models have their limits. So we are trying to choose the best one to use. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Do we have time for again? <laughs> Do we have time for one more question or? Sure. Yeah. I think. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Of course. So I have a question that is, this um, this CCL twenty one CCR seven axis is involved with several other diseases like cancer, breast cancer, in yeah. which pathways such as PI3 kinase and AKT is, are, are involved. So these proteins are involved in, in, this, in the activation of this axis. Um, do you think this pathway is also involved in, 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 the, in, in your context of neuroinflammation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yes, we we are still investigating the the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms, the secondary signaling, and uh, that's something we are also uh, intending to do in the next few years. Um, so, but yeah, I do. Uh, most of the most of the CCR seven action uh, uh, results in the in the I mean. Uh, in the there's cellular um, effects depend on ERK one and two signaling, P three signaling, signaling, so uh, and uh, beta histina arresting, beta arresting signaling. So we are uh, still trying to configure it, which one is the most in, uh, involved on our on that model of uh, neurodegeneration specifically. Okay. Thanks, Felipe. Very nice work. Thank you, Felipe. So let's Thank move to the, our next speaker. <laughs> that is Gracie. Grace? Gracie? Um, nice to meet you. Exactly. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> so let's have your presentation, Gustavo.
Um, ah. It's okay with my screen. Nice. Okay. Nice so, now. <laughs> okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Nascimento uh, Pires. My thesis advisors are Dr. Professor Dr. Henrique Rocha Mendonça and Professor Dr. Milena Batista Carneiro. Um, and today, I I um, I will present uh, my work called the association between neocortical demyelination and its stability in a multiple sclerosis animal model. So first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, multiple sclerosis. That is a disease that predisposes to imbalances of stability, leading to sensory, motor, and stability disturbance. Understanding protective mechanisms against demyelination and neuronal death are at birth and stimulates to remyelination may generate new therapies. At the histopathological level, multiple sclerosis lesions are characterized by oligodendrocyte death, demyelination, gliosis, axonal damage, and peripheral immune cell infiltration. And why it's important to study this mechanisms about uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, multiple sclerosis is the most common chronic inflammatory demyelinating and neurodegenerative disease of the central nervous system in young adults. Uh, multiple sclerosis patients are three to six times more likely to develop epilepsy compared to the rest of the population. And seizures are more common in patients with early onset of progressive forms of the disease and prognosticated rapid progression to disability and death. Seizures in multiple sclerosis may signal disease onset or relapse in a subset of patients and are associated with damaged cognitive function, fulminant disease course, and accelerated time to disability. And there is a lack of study exploring the relationship between multiple sclerosis, pathogenesis, and cerebral hyperstability. So the overgoal of this work was to investigate the relation between demyelination and seizure susceptibility in a multiple sclerosis mouse model. So for that, we use Curepizone model that is a toxic uh, model for toxic melanation. Uh, in this model, mice are fed with copper collector cuprison, leading to oligodendrocyte death. And you use two treatments, um, one with brown cast, that is a GPR17 antagonist uh, stimulating oligodendrocyte differentiation and maturation, and so myelination. And the second one is fingolimod, that is a drug used in multiple sclerosis treatment uh, and is a non-selective sphingosina 1-phosphate receptor modulator that regulates lymphocyte trafficking and retains lymphocyte within the lymph nodes. Uh, about mature as a method, uh, uh, we use uh, Swiss mouse uh, mice and uh, we have four groups, control group, cuprison group, brown cast, and figolimod. Uh, mice uh, were submitted to 0.2% uh, cuprison diet with concomitant daily treatment with uh, brown cast or figolimod for five weeks. And the treatment started six in the, at the sixth week. week. Um, at the 11th week, we, we did a uh, functional test like analgesimeter test, hot hot test, and grasping test um, to perform, uh, to understand about sensory motor function and multiple sclerosis in our model. Um, Pentileno tetrazole, a uh, GABA A uh, inib uh, receptor antagonist. Uh, was applied to apply nitroperitoneally to induce seizure to study severity and latency. 
uh, and use Racine's scale modified. And in the after seizure, our animals um, were uh, um, our, we performed the euthanasia. Uh, about our results, uh, here we have digital analgesimeter uh, that showed a sensory decrease in cuprison group and a partially recovering control levels with broadcast and fingolimod treatment. Uh, about Rotarod, overall, the, the uh, Rotarod test showed no significant difference between the groups. Uh, when analyzed about latency to first fall and the number of fall in different uh, rotation per minutes. Uh, about uh, grasping test, uh, we can see no different difference between the groups too. And when you see about uh, pentilano tertazole seizure, uh, here we have a Racine scale modified uh, with the eight phase and uh, in cuprazone group here in the sixth phase, we can see a longer duration of tonic seizure in a sitting, sitting position in, a, in this modified racine scale. And uh, the treatment with Prolocast and Fingolimod restored the, this, uh, this dura duration. Um, about latency, we can, we, we see there is no different, significant difference between the groups uh, in, in PTZ. And the analysis the, of the melanation and myelin repair after cuprazon died, um, we analyzed through immunohistochemistry. Uh, and here we have myelin-based protein immunoreactive. And our results indicated here in corpus callosus uh, that uh, there is a decreased myelin density in cuprazone group uh, and treatment with peroncast and fingolimod partially recover the level the level of myelination in corpus callosus. When uh, we see when we analyze motor cortex, we can see a decreased myelin density in cuprazone group and treatment uh, with brown cast and figolimod don't recover level of myelination. And here in somatosensory cortex, we can see a decrease uh, in myelin density in cuprazon group and the treatment with figolimod uh, partially recover the level of myelination. We quanti quantified oligodendrocyte progenitor cells uh, so here in ant NG, NG2 stain, uh, we can see that the, the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells increased in broadcast treatment in corpus callosus. When you study the motor cortex, um, we can see a decrease in figolimod treat, treat, treatment. And in the somatosensory cortex, we can see uh, a decrease, uh, sorry, an increase in broadcast and figolimod treatment. And here we, we did a NCCC1 stain to quantify the number of oligodendrocytes. And here you can see in corpus callosus that there is a decrease in, Q, in the number of CC1 positive oligodendrocytes, a decrease in these cells, the number of these cells and cuprazone group. In motor cortex, we can see CC1 positive oligodendrocytes decrease in cuprazone group and an increase in broadcast treatment. Uh, here in somatosensory cortex, we, we see a, a number, uh, a decrease in number of the cells in cuprazone group and an increase in broadcast treatment. So here uh, about conclusions, we can we reproduce an animal model of cuprazone scler uh, multiple sclerosis that present neuronation, oligodendrocyte death, decreased sensory function and increased brain stability. We conclude that treatment with peroncast and fingolimod risks myelination in corpus callosum 
the sensory function, and the severity of seizures, provide new therape therapeutic targets to multiple sclerosis and other demyelination disease. Demyelination disease. Uh, and broadcast treatment stimulates oligodendrocyte lineage proliferation and differentiation, while the same does not occur with fingernail treatment, suggesting possible different mechanisms of myelin protection or repair. So uh, I'd like to, to say thanks for all uh, my colleagues in, uh, at lab, 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 laboratory. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present in this event and this event evening. And thank you for Fundi Agents. Thank you, Gracie. Thank you, Grace. Congratulations. Uh, clear presentation, nice data. Um, let me ask you something that I'm very curious to hear what you think about. GPR17. Why everybody still says that it's an orphan receptor? It, 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 it's not... Uh, um, leukotrienes are not able to bind to it. I mean, uh, it's... It, I, I don't know why people still keep calling these receptors sometimes orphans. When, when it, it's already identified one or two or even three uh, ligands to them. And just to complete, uh, because you got some difference between Pranlucast and your other drug, um, and Pranlucast, uh, Pralucast, Pralucast, I don't know how to say exactly. Uh, uh, it's uh, 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 it's a uh, antagonist of CZLT1 uh, receptor for leukotrienes. Do you think leukotrienes can have any role on the, in your model? Uh, I can repeat the end of your question. Question. And I'm 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 asking if uh, mm -hmm. uh, leukotrienes can have any role in your model because. Pralucast is an uh, as antagonist of the cis L two one and L two two receptors. Mm, sorry, not only it's it's because uh, Pralucast is not selective to GPR seventeen. You know that it's a, a antagonist for cis L two one receptor. Yes. So that's why I'm asking, and, and there is some data showing that leukotrienes can bind to GPR-17. So that's why I'm asking if you think that there are any role for leukotrienes on your model, since you are... So I, I don't know um, uh, about this, this data. Um, um, so I can talk in with details about it. Okay, I think it's 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 uh, sometimes very different areas uh, collide. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in your in your case, because pralocast is a, it's a drug that's using asthma because yes, of yes. The, the, the antagonism of this receptor. So I think it's very interesting that you uh, look at leukotrienes and the, if they can have. Uh, you know, be pro being produced uh, close to your cells and have any role on that. I think it would be interesting as an endogenous ligand for your receptor. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't think we have time for other questions. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, Gra Gracie, very much again. And let's move to the next speaker. That is Isadora de Andrade. Hi, Isadora. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank the invitation for our presentation. It's a pleasure to share my, my work in this workshop. I am Isadora Ramos de Andrade. PhD student from ERG, and I present my work in tile extracellular vesicles released by adipose tissue from obese subjects can induce epithelial mesenchymal transition in breast cancer cells. Obesity is an inflammatory disease, and many studies have shown uh, its association with several types of cancer, 
including breast, breast cancer, which is the main type of cancer that affects women. So the adipose tissue can release the fatty acids, pro-inflammatory adipokines, extracellular vesicles that interact with breast cancer cells and modulate the microenvironment. Extracellular vesicles are small membrane, membrane vesicles capable of carrying several molecules, such as nucleases, proteins, that mediate the intercellular communication. We have already published that obese patients present a more quantity of microparticles in the circulation compared to lean patients, and they are predominantly originated from preadipocytes and leukocytes, and also the adipose tissue from obese patients compared to lean AT secretes a large amount of microparticles with the same profile, suggesting that the increase in microparticles in the circulation of obese patients is sustained by the adipose tissue. We also published that coincident media and extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue increase the MC77 cell proliferation via auric signaling pathway, increase the MDA, MB to run cells migration and invasiveness via AKT signaling pathway, and also extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue are enriched in bioactive MMP9 and leptin. One reason for cells becoming more invasive is through epithelial mesenchymal transition. In this process, epithelial cells lose their polarity, their epithelial markers such as ecadering, cloudings, and start to express mesenchymal markers such as ecadering, vimentin, presenting the ability to dissociate and invade other tissues. So, our aim was the characterization of the secretome and extracellular vesicles released by adipose tissue from obese and lean individuals and the evaluation of their effect on the induction of epithelial mesenchymal transition in two human breast cancer lines, MCF7, non-invasive, and MJMB21 invasive cells. The coincident media from adipose tissue was obtained from obese patients that were submitted to bariatric surgery or lean patients that were submitted to plastic surgery. The adipose tissue was in contact during 24 hours with a culture medium. After this time, the coincident media was filtered to remove cell debris, filtered, and then used it for a stimulus for cells, for a lipidomic assay and milliplex. So we analyzed the lipid profile released by obese and lean adipose tissue. And as we can see, the coincident media from obese visceral adipose tissue compared to lean AT presents high quantity of polyunsaturated and, and saturated fatty acids such as palmitate. We analyzed the panel of adipokines released by obese and lean adipose tissue. And as we can see, the coincident media from visceral obese adipose tissue present release pro-inflammatory adipokines such as TNF, IL-6, and the three is a form of TGF beta compared to lean AT. Uh, we uh, obtained the extracellular vesicles from the conditioned media of the adipose tissue. So the conditioned media was sent fielded, and then the extracellular vesicles were used for stimulus for cells, for proteomics analyze, and for western blood. So we performed a proteomics analysis in the microparticles, and I want to highlight that the extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue present proteins related to cancer progression, such as perlecam, galactin-1, protein S100A4. And once we saw that the congenital media from obese adipose tissue present a high quantity of TGF beta, 
we evaluated the expression of TGF beta on extracellular vesicles. And as we can see, the extracellular vesicles from obese subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue present the ex expression of TGF beta compared to extra ve extracellular vesicles from linear T. And it's important to emphasize that TGF beta is a potent inductor of epithelial mesenchymal transition. We also analyzed another protein related to epithelial mesenchymal transition, vimentin, and also the extracellular vesicles from both subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue presented high expression of vimentin compared to extracellular vesicles from lean adipose tissue. So we asked what's the effect of congestionate media and extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue upon epithelial mesenchymal markers. So we evaluated the expression of ecaserin uh, epithelial marker on MCF7 cells. We didn't observe a difference in the expression of ecaserin when the cells were treated with coincident media from obese adipose tissue. But extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue decreased the expression of ecaserin. We analyzed another epithelial marker, Claudine 1, and we didn't see uh, a statistical difference in the decrease of Claudine 1, but we can observe uh, a trend in decrease of Claudine 1 uh, caused by the continued media from obese adipose tissue. We evaluated uh, a mesenchymal marker of SMA on MCF7 cells, and we observed that only extracellular vesicles from obese visceral adipose tissue increased the expression of alpha SMA compared to, to linear T. We analyzed another uh, mesenchymal marker, Vimentin, on MDM built to run cells. And we also observed that only extracellular vesicles from obese subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue increased the expression of vimentin on MDM built to run cells compared to control. Once we know that epithelial cells, when they are in the process of epithelial mesenchymal transition, they present a migratory character. We asked you what is the effect of continued media and extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue upon MCF7 cells migration. And as we can see, extracellular vesicles from obese adipose tissue increased the MCF7 cells migration compared to linear T at the time of 24 hours, remaining during the time of 48 hours, and the continued media from uh, subcutaneous and visceral adipose, obese adipose tissue increased the MCF7 cell migration at the time of 48 hours. In conclusion, until, until this moment, we showed that adipose tissue from obese subjects can release fatty acids, pro-inflammatory adipokines such as TNF, IL-6, extracellular vesicles containing proteins relating to tumor progression such as vimentin, TGF-beta, perlecan, which can induce in M7 cells the decrease in epithelial marker ecadering and increasing the mesenchymal marker of SMA and increasing the migration of these cells. And on MDA in B2 run cells, the increase in vimentin expression. I would like all the, the groups lab, LEFCM, the collaborators, and the financial support. Congratulations, Isadora. Thank you, Isadora. Beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, you want Let's to start, Leo? Check for questions on YouTube. I would like to, to 
make a question. Um, why this um, obese uh, AT-derived extracellular vesicles, they harbor uh, higher levels of um, EMT markers. Uh, do you think this is due because these cells express normally higher levels of these proteins? Or do you think that these proteins in the, in the obese tissue, they are somehow uh, specifically targeted to these vesicles? I think that are both. I think that the extracellular vesicles from obese adiposite tissue release more proteins related to tumor progression because this tissue is an inflammatory tissue. And also because I think that the, the machinery that selects the cargo of the extracellular vesicles can be specific. And also these extracellular vesicles can present um, atropism for cancer cells. And they can act directly uh, into the, the cancer cells, carrying their content. OK. Perfect. I have two, two questions. One, it's, uh, uh, I don't know if I, I, I saw uh, right. Uh, because it was very big, but did uh, leptin levels were not altered at all in your quantification? In, in, in the quantitative media, uh, that this cohort of patients that we performed this assay, we didn't see a statistical difference on leptin, and I I believe that the lean patients that we used in this essay showed uh, increased levels of leptin. So I think that because of that, we didn't uh, have a difference. And it okay. was important because we avoided to use these patients in the following experiments because it's oh. very bad for us. I see. Um, and another thing is, uh, both the the vesicles and the the soluble mediators they are being released by your uh, tissue but this is a mixed tissue with a mixed population of cells do uh, are you considering analyzing the so the cell the, the particular cell sources of uh, they are not really homogeneous vesicles because they probably are coming from different cells. How do you conciliate this right now? Yes, because how we we work with uh, uh, a tissue and we have many different cells in, in this tissue, we cannot uh, affirm that is because of she cell, but uh, in the uh, the early paper that I showed that the microparticles are increased in obese patients, we showed that they are predominantly from preadipocytes and leukocytes. Okay. And even leukocytes is a mixed population also. I, I think it yes. would be very interesting to have this, uh, you know, characterization. I don't know how feasible is it for you but would be very nice. So congratulations, Isadora. Thank uh, you. Uh, beautiful presentation. And let's move on to, thank you. And let's move on to the next speaker. That is, oh. Jesuino? Yeah, Rafael, yes. Um, maybe Gustavo is not here. <laughs> <laughs> Tem pergunta no? Ah, sorry. We have questions <laughs> on the chat. No problem, uh, uh, No, no. Não apareceu. Ih, caramba, acabei de fechar meu YouTube. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, everybody. I'm trying to contact the manager of the room. So we can move to the next speaker.
אוקיי, אוקיי. אה. אוקיי. So now we have the presentation of Jesuino Rafael Ferreira that he unfortunately has, uh, was unable to activate his video. But uh, Jesuino, when you want to start, it's with you. Okay. Good afternoon. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, my name is Jesuino. And I'm going to present the work entitled Peritoneal Macrophage Metabolism and Tissue Redox Balance are Modulated by Tone Receptors. This work was supervised by Alessandro Filardi at the Instituto de Microbiology Paulo de Góes. Macrophage are key cells for innate immunity and ephrocytosis. Ephrocytic tone receptors, Axel and MRTK, indirectly recognize phosphatidylserine expressed by apoptotic cells through bright mole molecules GAI-6 or protein S, and their activation results in enterocytosis and inhibition of inflammatory responses via ne a negative feedback loop involving activation of suppressor of cytokine sig signaling on entry. Ephrocytosis impacts in macrophage functional differentiation and is accompanied by the modulation of energy metabolism. Thus, classically, uh, activate macrophage M1, M1 preferentially uses aerobic glyco glycolysis, varberic effect, to produce energy, while alternatively activating macrophage M2 preferentially generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. In this context, we believe that the energetic metabolic state of macrophage changes according to the dynamic functional modifications of the cells in response to ethyrocytosis dur during homeostasis. The aim of the study was to investigate how Exo and MRTK receptor mediate ephrocytosis, modulate the energy metabolism of peritoneal macrophages in homeostasis, well, well, um, as well as their role in tissue redox regulation. For this work, the peritoneal cavity of black cis wild type Exo and MRTK deficient was washed and the cell populations of the immune system were analyzed by flow cytometry. Peritoneal macrophages were isolated to investigate their phenotype, functional and metabolic, metabolic capacity. Adipose and lung tissues were collected and homo, homogenized for analysis of oxidative stress biomarkers. We found increasing the numbers of peritoneal macrophages in MRTK knockout mice compared to wild type and high level, le, uh, levels of nitric oxide in the peritoneal cavity of exo knockout mice compared to wild type mice. But uh, peritoneal macrophages in, in vitro release significantly less lactate compared to the other group, groups. By multivariate metabolomic analysis, we found that fatty acids, lactate, and citrate was altered among to the, to the three groups. Uh, and a significantly uh, higher lactate production in peritoneal macrophages, exo, and metric knockout, with or without LPS stimulation after 24 hours, compared uh, to peritoneal macrophage wild type. In addition, we found elevated lactate levels in cultures supernatants from peritoneal macrophage exo and MRTK knockout, cultured with antimycin, 6, uh, 24, and 48 hours compared to peritoneal macrophage wild, wild type. Finally, we found the ethylocytosis mediated by exo and receptors altered, altered 
Oxidative Stress Biomarkers e Adipose and Lung Tissues. Induce a é, increase in lipid peroxidation, é, antioxidant capacity and antioxidant en é, enzyme activity and a decrease in carbonylation levels and formation of tiol groups into proteins. Collectively, our results suggest that uh, efeocytosis mediated by exo MRTK receptors regulates the numbers, function, and, and metabolism of peritoneal macrophages, induce an anti-inflammatory phenotype, and alter tissue redox balance. I would like to thank the members of the of the Laboratory de Immunologia Solar at UFRJ, all our collaborators and fund agencies. Thanks. Congratulations, very nice data. Congratulations, Rafael. Nice work. Thanks. Um, Leo, okay. Do you want to start? Sorry. Yes. Um, I have a question that is maybe very innocent, but um, do you think, that, do you know if these receptors, um, Axel and Mertike, they have other functions than atherocytosis? And I'm asking that because um can you really uh, uh, state that these receptors are mediating atherocytosis in this in the in the model you're you're using i'm just wondering if there are other functions for this uh these two receptors um and the study of the receptors is recent and um, Okay, uh, don't worry about that, uh, Rafa, it's just a, a very uh, uh, broad uh, question. Um, the other one was... Okay, uh, do you guys plan to use those two inhibitors? I, I took note of their names here. Um, RxDx106 uh, and R428. Do you think that using this two uh, uh, inhibitors, uh, uh, would you guys see the same um, the same effect in the um, redox balance? Mm -hmm. I use the uh, antimycin. Okay. I have a problem with my audio right now because there is a something happening here. Leo, I don't know if you want to, to wrap the session. Okay, Sorry. no problem. So I would like to, to thank all the, the, the students. Um, I would like to leave a message that uh, you guys are the future of Brazilian research. Please do not give up. We, we really need you guys. I know it's I know we are uh, 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 going through a very, uh, a very tough period, but do not give up. Um, I would like to thank the, the audience. Uh, we had a very good audience, I would say, uh, um, in, on YouTube. Um, all the work presented here was really nice and very uh, promising. I would like to congratulate the students, um, their advisors, uh, their lab mates, um and i hope to see you all on wednesday right chris october 10th. yes Time. yeah uh so i also would like to uh, congratulate all the the speakers again um we have a, a, a moment dedicated to you all on next wednesday in the the program of the the workshop and hope see you all there. 
um, beautiful work. Don't give up. Stay with us. And uh, see you on Wednesday. Congratulations. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you.